Okay. So thank you all very much. This is the October 21 installment of the Microsoft Data Platform Continuity Virtual Group. With me today is Rick Lowe. Uh, he is a very understated individual. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met, one of the best DBAs I've ever met, and arguably one of the quietest DBAs I've ever met. Um, what Rick is going to talk about today is a, a session that's near and dear to all of us. We all have quirks and just abnormal oddities with all the stuff that we work on day in and day out. So the title of the session is Weird Stuff I Saw While Working with Multi-Subnet Availability Groups. And if you've already been working with these or have been exploring this but haven't put them into production yet, or if this is just new to you, take notes. This will be out on YouTube, but still take notes because these are the oddball stuff that we hit all the time. So with that, I am going to turn this over. Rick, I'm going to make you co-host here, and uh, you can take it for take it away. Awesome. Thanks, David. Let me... Sorry, struggling with Zoom. There we go. Can you see my screen, David? Looks great. Awesome. Yep. So uh, everybody, thanks. Thanks for coming to hear this. Um, it's actually, I think, been a year since I presented. I have not been good about keep, keeping on top of this during COVID. So I'm sure there'd be plenty of ums and ahs and, you know, verbal stumbles to, to entertain you through the hour. <laughs> uh, yeah, as David said, we're here to talk about weird stuff I saw while working with multi-subnet AGs. Um, a little bit about me. Of course, my name is Rick Lowe. Uh, I'm an independent SQL Server consultant based uh, nowadays based in Washington State, kind of sort of Seattle-ish. You know, as a crow flies, I think I'm actually closer to Victoria than I am to Seattle, but um, yeah, it's probably more detailed than you really need. Um, email address is on the slide. Feel free to reach out. If I don't mention that at the end, feel free to reach out with questions um, and stuff about the session. I'm on Twitter as Dataflow, sort of. Uh, I was more active in using lots of SQL Saturdays. Hopefully, that means I'll be more active again uh, post pandemic. And I am a uh, Microsoft certified master for SQL Server. Uh, the program's been defunct uh, for a while, but there's, uh, gosh, I don't know, like two or 300 of us that got through it before the program was terminated. So, what will we be talking about? Well, we're going to be talking about weird stuff, specifically weird failures with availability groups. Um, my focus is on stuff that has to do with multiple subnets, just because things get crazier when you add a second subnet to an AG. And a lot of people are surprised by the behaviors, so they're just more interesting. But I actually do, the last of the three demos actually has nothing to do with multiple subnets. It's just such a cool problem, I had to talk about it. And I'm only really going to be talking about traditional, uh, boring Windows availability groups. Um, so for a change, I'm not going to be talking about Linux, unfortunately. Uh, we're not going to be talking about read scale AGs. Um, I'm not going to be talking about DAGs either in this talk, although I probably could do an entire other session on fun stuff uh, around there. It's just out of scope for this. <laughs> But let's start with kind of a quick uh, review, because this, this might also point you towards some problems you could run, run into that I won't cover in the demos just because there's so much to go through. Um, but when we talk about availability groups, uh, they really are different in a lot of ways from the fail requesters that we used to work with, you know, back in the bad old days around the turn of the millennium. The biggest differences really are storage uh, is not shared in AGs, uh, at least not typically. Uh, each server has its own copy of the data, which some people don't like that because your storage costs double. That's actually a very, very good thing because it eliminates kind of an important single source of failure that we used to have in terms of data corruption. The service runs in all the nodes. In other words, we aren't relying on the cluster to start and stop SQL Server for us anymore. Um, on the secondary nodes, there is always a SQL Server service you can connect to. You just uh, may or may not be able to see the available databases. And because each node has its own copy of the data, um, we can it's possible to configure readable secondaries. However, so going through all that, a lot of people kind of get the impression that this isn't really a cluster thing anymore. Um, that's actually not true. Clusters are still required to make availability groups run. They're actually really, really, really important. And 
they can actually be a source of some of the issues that we'll run into in setting these up. So if we aren't using, if we aren't doing a failover cluster for SQL Server anymore, why do we have a cluster? The biggest reason is reason is simply quorum. Um, but we'll talk about quorum coming up, but you, you need to be able to keep track of who is alive, who's not alive, and who is currently the primary node. And um, the clusters that were already built into Windows are a fantastic way of handling all that stuff. The cluster also does most of the heavy lifting to implement the, the listener. So back in the failover cluster days, we had kind of a shared IP address that would bounce around between nodes as we failed over. With an availability group, of course, we actually have a listener, which is more like a shared network name that bounces around um, between hosts we fail over. Um, and that is, that is still handled by the, by the cluster. And there's uh, basically a bunch of just general kind of node health stuff that is taken care of by the failover cluster for us so that SQL Server doesn't have to worry about it. So what kinds of things do we need? Um, one thing that's easy to forget about, of course, uh, because a cluster is required, all the nodes have to be in a cluster. So if we're talking about a normal availability group and not something like a DAG, uh, that really means all the nodes have to be in the same domain, which means if we're dealing with multiple sites, so if we have an availability group that covers both our primary and our disaster recovery site, the domain has to be stretched across that connection. Uh, same thing if we have a kind of uh, hybrid on-prem and public cloud setup. Um, if we have our disaster recovery site in Amazon, we have to do the work to stretch the domain uh, across the direct connect, uh, connection. Uh, however, multiple subnets are fine with availability groups, um, obviously, since that's most of what I'm talking about in this talk. Um, this next one is actually really important because it's easy to miss. When you're setting up the cluster object for the AG, every object in the cluster should have an IP. Uh, every subnet involved should have an IP. This is important because the, the wizard actually won't make you do it. It is possible, you're not likely to do it accidentally, but it is possible to set up a cluster that doesn't actually have any dedicated IPs. And, and I'll just try to use, um, I'll just try to dynamically get an IP address. Um, but it is actually really, really easy to accidentally set up a cluster that has one IP address for the first subnet that was involved with it but doesn't have any other IPs for the other uh, subnets that it needs. Uh, this is problematic because it mostly works. Uh, your cluster will work fine until it doesn't. And the point where it stops working fine is usually when you fail over uh, to your disaster recovery site. I know I've probably spent way too many words on this topic, but it's a long way of saying, I'm not gonna cover this specific thing in the demos, but if you're doing this uh, back at the office, do be sure you check to be sure you have all the IPs you need in your cluster. Um, the other thing you really need, and this one uh, you can't really forget, that the wizard won't let you forget, so it's not as big of a problem. If a listener is used, you must have an IP for each subnet. It's actually not possible to add nodes to the AG unless you have that IP set up. Technically, listeners are optional. You can have an, IP, uh, an AG that just does data synchronization, but you know, real world, why, why would you bother with that? If we're going to all the effort to set up an availability group, we probably want that listener so that we can gracefully handle failovers when they happen. And I, uh, I promise I'm almost through this uh, review stuff. Um, but on the first slide, I did mention that one of the things the cluster does for us is manage quorum. Um, here, here's how I think about quorum. Oftentimes we'll think about the role of, of an availability group to be sure that we have a database server that we can connect to when we need it. It's not actually that simple. The availability group actually needs to do two things. It needs to be sure we have a database that we can connect to, but just as importantly, it needs to be sure that there is exactly one um, source of truth database. Uh, that's the primary node we can connect to. It's, it's almost worse if there are two databases uh, connected to the listener that we're connecting to, because we can have all kinds of, of data issues if that ever happens. That's referred to as split brain. And um, the simplest way to think of quorum is um, if a majority of the nodes that are part of the cluster agree about who is online, we're fine. If you cannot get a majority of the votes to agree on who is online, the appropriate thing to do is to shut the cluster down. Um, which can take people by surprise, but that's better than the alternative. Um, 
And quickly, if what if you have an even number of nodes? Well, it's actually very, very common to have an even number of nodes in the cluster, and we can have this called a witness to break ties. Uh, there's a few types of witnesses. Well, I'll be touching on them again later on. But that's that's more than enough talking. We should uh, go ahead and jump straight into the demos. Now, this first one is kind of a uh, straight up failover disaster recovery site. Um, I did a, uh, oh, sorry, kill the audio. I did pre record these. Uh, I forgot to cancel the audio track uh, just because th there's points where the demos are just uh, too long to do live. So here's our setup for the first demo. We have a two node availability group. One node is at our primary data center. The other node is at our disaster recovery site. Um, because we're simulating a double site setup, there are two different subnets involved. Uh, and there is a file share witness to break the ties. However, unfortunately, uh, we're saying that file share witness is over at the primary site. Is that best practice? No. But unfortunately, it's actually a, a common practice. So it's, it's fair game for this demo. Um, so finishing the motivation for the setup, uh, we're in a situation where uh, a tornado was just at our primary site, for example. Both the uh, node that was online at the time and also our file sh share witness um, are toast. And all we have left is what we had at the DR site. Um, so it's time to go ahead and try to do a, uh, a quick failover to DR. Sorry, fast forward. There we go. Sorry, overshot. So uh, typically, we're, we're used to letting the wizards that are built in the SQL Server Management Studio do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. I mean, you know, um, a lot of DBAs have gotten to the points where everything is scripted out and they have the scripts handy, uh, but that, that's not universal. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it's not that unusual to rely on the tool. And that's not a bad thing. The wizards are there for a reason. Uh, so here we are, we're at the, we have connected the DR site. We've launched Management Studio and we're gonna say, you know, hey, I'm just gonna, you know, go over here to my availability group, um, and named Ag Ag or AG AG. Um, I'm going to go ahead, just connect to my uh, right click on the availability group. Say that I want to fail over. Come on, virtual Rick, be faster. It's one of those times where I kind of regret pre recording some of this, even if it's a necessity. We expect a nice wizard to come up, but instead we get this weird pop up window that just says, you know, hey, you don't have quorum. Your, your cluster is not happy. I can't help you if your cluster is not happy. Uh, please go fix it. Well, shoot, we weren't expecting this to happen. Uh, so that's not good. Um, so let's go ahead, let's just hit the web, start searching. And pretty quickly, we'll, we'll find a little bit of help there. According to the web, uh, we should be able to just start up our uh, trusty friend, the failover cluster manager. And there's an option there to force the cluster online. So here we go. No, I don't want to try admin center right now. And gosh, this doesn't look right. We're used to seeing our cluster in here, but it's missing. Let's try connecting just in case it's having an auto connect problem. Um, okay, look all right. And uh, huh. so spoiler alert, it's not actually gonna connect. I'm just gonna push this window out of the way and let it spin until it fails. So here's the problem. We you know, did not know that the disaster was coming. So we didn't have the, you know, you know, foresight or, you know, premonition that we should leave failover cluster manager running at the DR site. Because it wasn't already running, when we start up this tool, there isn't actually a cluster, a healthy cluster out there for it to connect to. Well, you know, that's, that's okay. Um, if we keep searching a little bit, we found some PowerShell stuff that can help us out here. Uh, there we go. Failover cluster manager finally gave up. Let's, uh, Go ahead and get the window out of the way. So at a high level, what needs to happen when we're using the command line approach is we need to stop the failover cluster service on this node uh, because it will never be able to get quorum. We're missing two of the three votes. Uh, 
we need to restart it with a special option that says uh, to force the quorum, literally to just go ahead and bring the cluster online. Um, so the blank screen there is where I cut out about five, four minutes of waiting. And you'll notice all this red text all over the place. This is confusing. That's actually OK. We're, we're getting this error message because the majority of our infrastructure is at our primary site, and it's now missing. Uh, and PowerShell is kind of upset that it can't reach it. Um, but we can actually see the service did go down OK. So our stop cluster node command went through fine. OK, cool. So we used stop cluster node to bring down the service. Let's go ahead and do start cluster node. Sorry, I'm moving something out the way saying see better. The part that we have to do now is to Gosh, sorry, folks. Gosh, that's just embarrassing. Note to self, use caution when pre-recording demos. Okay, so we start with our stop, backing up a little bit, we start with a stop cluster node command to stop the service. Um, it's actually gonna hang for like a good three or four minutes. So shortly you're gonna see a, a blank spot in the recording where I, I paused and started it when it came back to life. And as I already said, this red text is actually red herring. Uh, PowerShell is complaining because you know so much of our stuff is missing because it's at the primary site that just got taken out by a tornado. Um, but the service actually did go down okay, which is you know what we were looking to accomplish by stopping the cluster node. Cool. Okay, so what do you do? What do we do now? Uh, we need to bring the service back up. We need to bring it back up with quorum forced and we cannot do that from within the, uh, the computer management tool that I just had open there because uh, there's no way to pass in parameters from there well there is but you know we don't want to have to go in and like edit the service de definition so the PowerShell command for this is just start cluster node and dash force quorum now the good news is this actually goes pretty fast. We don't have to wait for like four minutes with you know our client or our boss or whatever stakeholder breathing down our neck while we you know wait for things to come back. And if we go to the failover cluster manager, open it back up. No, I still don't want to use admin center. We can see that our cluster is there now. It's not healthy, you know, we're, we're missing one of our nodes. SQL Server isn't running because we were using asynchronous uh, synchronization when it went down, so the data is out of sync. Um, our file share witness is gone, but the cluster is functional. And the good news is, you know, from this point, it's actually kind of downhill. We can actually right click on our availability group failover. Next. You see warnings kind of all over the place that our data is out of synchronization. Um, and I actually, this is one thing I, I love in, in a weird way I love about doing the uh, asynchronous failovers, especially in, if you're doing it in T-SQL, because you know, here you have all these uh, places on the GUI telling you data is out of sync. If you're using T-SQL, the command for doing, for doing a uh, forced failover actually isn't you know, alter availability group failover. It's actually you know, alter availability group forced failover allow data loss. You know, that there's no way to go through that and at the end say, I didn't expect to lose data. I thought it'd be okay. Um, it's uh, 
I, I'm not being sarcastic when I say I actually kind of love that about these commands. So here we have to check a box to say, yes, I understand I could lose data, but please just give me my database back. We need DR online. And cool, we're done. Well, we're almost done. Uh, we just have to wait for the databases to recover. Close it out. Go to our dashboard. Yeah, and um, you know, it's still not healthy because we're missing a node. It's going to complain about that, but we're up and running, which is cool. But there is a problem you might run into the first time you do this that I uh, kind of glossed over. I'm going to shut down the cluster service and restart it without parameters again to put us back into this the space where the cluster service is uh, where the cluster service is broken and doesn't have quorum. So it's going down. Bring the cluster back up and it'll be in a broken mode. Okay. So here's the thing. Yeah, I should check to be sure I'm not lying and that the cluster really is not available. Yep, fail over cluster manager is unhappy again. So here's the thing, the module that stop cluster node, start cluster node and get cluster are in actually is not installed in Windows by default. So I'm going to uh, run a couple commands here. Here I'm just turning off an auto load functionality in PowerShell and I'm gonna run another command to forcibly unload the module just to simulate the situation where we're behind a Windows server that has not had this installed yet. And so typically, if you're doing a lot of work with availability groups, um, this module will be installed because you kind of need it to adjust some of the settings. But there's a good chance you have not done that on your disaster recovery site. Um, so yeah, let's say we, we get over to the disaster recovery machine. We've discovered we can't just fail over SQL Server. We need a force quorum. We've opened up our PowerShell window. We've gotten those commands that we uh, got from searching the web, and we start with the first one, stop cluster node. This error does matter. This is a different error that's basically saying, hey, I have no idea what this stop cluster node is. Um, OK. So there's a few things we could do if you run into this. Uh, obviously, you could just install uh, the PowerShell module through the, uh, the server manager. Um, that's fine. That's not a bad thing to do. It's probably not a bad idea to have it anyway. But if you're in a hurry, uh, there is another option. We can just go old school with this and use the DOS, or I'm sorry, not DOS, the command shell commands. So there's a command net stop that will stop a service. And you have to know the real service name as opposed to the, the user friendly long name. But here we say net stop plus service because that's always going to be the name of the cluster service in Windows. And the nice thing about this is when I hit return, it's actually going to stop pretty quickly. You notice I didn't have to stop the recording and throw away like four minutes of dead space because we're not looking at the rest of the cluster when we do this way. So in some ways, this might be preferable if like you know half of your cluster nodes are missing. Uh, so now that the service is down, we do net start, same service name, and slash force quorum. And at this point, our cluster service, our cluster is back up and running. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and bail out the demo because uh, nothing interesting will be happening. So what did we see? Uh, so what's what's rule number one of disaster recovery failover? Rule number one of disaster recovery failover is practice disaster recovery ahead of disaster. What's rule number two of disaster recovery failover? Practice disaster recovery before a disaster happens. Uh, that's actually not rule number two on the sheet, but it probably should be. Um, I can't stress strongly enough that uh, if you haven't done a force quorum failover before, um, and especially if you have multiple subnets involved, I, I didn't touch on this in the demo, but uh, if you have multiple subnets involved, this is where you might discover you're missing IP addresses in the cluster object. Um, Absolutely be sure to practice it. Uh, be prepared for quorums. You want to know how to do that ahead of time. And I, I put them in the slides just for documentation, but uh, we, we saw the op both options inside the demo, the partial option and the uh, 
somewhat faster um, net start option. And when we're talking disaster recovery, we should be aware that usually failover will be forced. So we should be comfortable uh, with what the messages mean when they say that we're going to be losing data potentially. And if we're using scripts, we should uh, be ready with the uh, force failover uh, command instead of just the normal alter availability group failover command. The final thing I would say is one of the problems in this particular demo was the fact that we were using a file share witness and the file share witness is actually at our primary site. When you have multiple subnets involved, um, that, that's kind of a common issue that typically we'll pick one of those subnets to be the host of the file share witness. And if we lose everything on that subnet, we've also lost our witness. There is a way around it. There's something called a cloud witness, um, which is sent, which really just means that we're storing the witness information uh, up in Microsoft Azure, uh, and all of the at all the sites, all the subnets, they'll be able to access the witness from there. So in this particular case, had we done that, we would have been able to get quorum for the cluster without messing with uh, the cryptic commands at the point we lost the primary site. Now, real world, that might not be as true because in the real world, we usually have more uh, availability group nodes at the primary site than at the DR site. So we're still likely to have quorum problems, but the cloud witness does help. I suppose the downside of the cloud witness is it is a cloud thing. So you do have to have internet access, uh, which is, is a problem for some organizations. And I can't say it often enough, practice your DR failover before you have an actual disaster to worry about. Okay, so with that, to try to keep the pace going, um, I'm going to jump straight into the next demo. This one's a little bit more interesting. So the setup for this, the setup for this demo is um, essentially we had a, let's say we had an existing availability group that only involved a single subnet at our primary site. We, we've been told that we need to set up a disaster recovery site. So we uh, spin up a new site, got a new subnet build out there, build out some new infrastructure. You know, so we basically spin up a server, installed SQL Server, um, added the new server to the cluster node, added the new server to the availability group, synced up the data. Um, but we did not actually reboot anything at the primary site. And it's not that we should have. We, we did the right thing by not rebooting everything because nothing actually changed at the primary site. The only stuff that we changed was over at our DR site. Um, and I should backtrack and say, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the hardware setup. So uh, to be honest, this is actually the same availability group we were just looking at. I just changed it so that um, I switched it over to synchronous uh, synchronization instead of asynchronous, um, just to make it look. Uh, more like what we expect. Uh, it's still a two node availability group uh, with a file share witness to break ties. Um, and we have a listener. I, I get a little punchy when I'm thinking of names for my demo. So I just call the listener, listen up. Um, you know, real world that have a much, much, much more informative name. But anyway, so there, that was a situation. Let's say we set up our DR site, nothing really bad happened. Uh, days, weeks went by, and everything kept working great. Um, then when you get to about one month out, it's time to do Windows patches. So somebody comes in on the weekend, they do all the Windows patches, uh, they hopefully do a SQL Server cumulative update, uh, and then they have to reboot everything as part of that process. This will be the first time that stuff has been rebooted since we added that new subnet to the AG. And actually, worst case scenario, and it's weird to say worst case when I say this, worst case scenario, the person doing the patching may have actually done some basic testing, uh, basic connection testing to be sure that things are up and running and that they can hit the database and everything looked fine. So they went home, uh, everything continued to run fine through the weekend. And then Monday rolls around. Uh, everyone comes in, the server starts getting busier. Um, Again. Uh, so Monday rolls around, the server starts getting uh, busier, and folks start reporting really, really weird uh, connection problems. 
So for example, some clients will connect to the database server successfully, others will not. Um, some of the developers, for example, may say that they're able to connect to the database server fine from inside Visual Studio, but not from inside SQL Server Management Studio. They aren't able to actually reproduce any of this on demand. Um, I actually, unfortunately, can't reliably reproduce a lot of these issues in the demo, but I'm going to show you the core problem. So if we open up Command Shell or PowerShell and do NS lookup, and then just apply the listener name that we typically connect to for the database. We probably are surprised to see two IP addresses here. Uh, what are these IPs? So these are the two IPs that we assign to the listener because there's two different subnets uh, associated with the availability group. And depending on which subnet the current primary node is sitting on, with one of these two IPs might be the appropriate one to use. Now, what's probably going to surprise us about this is it's not the case that you can just pick any IP that's been assigned to the listener and connect to it and expect a response. There's only one that's going to be warm and receptive at a time. The other one is going to be cold uh, and not respond to you. So we would actually, if we didn't know to expect this, we would probably only expect the actual IP address that we could use to come back when we do an NS lookup instead of getting both of them back. Um, is this even legitimate? Well, actually it is. It's, you know, it's always been supported that you can have multiple IP addresses for uh, MDNS. But the problem that we run into is from the networking perspective that was done as kind of a quick and dirty um, load balancing, uh, essentially a uh, replacement if you can't afford a real load balancer, but the expectation that all the IP addresses would be good. What, what happens with an availability group is they're listing multiple IP addresses uh, by default, uh, but only one of them is actually good. And if anyone tries to connect to the other one, uh, they won't get a response and they'll have to you know, wait 30 seconds or possibly longer for a timeout to happen. Uh, even if the software is smart enough to try the other IP address. OK, so how do we fix this? Um, well, first, we need to have the appropriate PowerShell module installed to be able to do cluster stuff in PowerShell. Uh, I, I believe you can only adjust this in PowerShell. There's no way to do it from the failover cluster manager. The first thing we need to do is find, figure out the internal name of our listener. So inside the cluster, our listener is not going to be named listen up that's going to have a more complex name. So the PowerShell for that is get cluster resource. And sorry, this is going to be drinking from a fire hose. Get cluster resource lists all the resources available associated with our cluster. And here we can see on the list, this looks like our listener. So yeah, let's go ahead and check that. Get cluster resource, pass in the name, and sure, we've gotten it. OK. So now we can't just change a uh, setting inside this object. We need to change a parameter. So we pipe that object into the get cluster parameter command. And this is where we can actually see the settings that we need to change. I'll point out there is a time to live record in here you probably want to adjust. Mm -hmm. I won't dwell on it for the demo, but you know it defaults to something like 20 minutes. Uh, and you know typically when I adjust something, I'll make it something a little bit more sane. Um, but yeah, it's mostly out of scope for this talk. The setting that we're really looking for is this register all providers IP. And it does exactly what it sounds like. If this is set to one, all of the IP addresses associated with the listener will be registered with DNS. And it defaults to one. At least it defaults to one if you set this up from inside Management Studio. And we kind of always set this up from inside Management Studio. It's really unusual to use PowerShell directly to set up the listeners. So if it's set to one, all the IP addresses will be registered with DNS. If it's set to zero, then we get the behavior that we might have expected had we not just had this conversation. If it's set to zero, only the IP address that's actually in use is uh, registered with DNS. So let's go ahead and change it. Similar process, we get our cluster resource, pipe it into set cluster parameter instead of get cluster parameter. And set cluster parameter is going to end up taking two arguments when we get to that point. The first argument is going to be the name of the parameter we're changing setting. So here it's register all provider IPs. And the second parameter is the new value. Okay, 
cool, we set it to zero. Well, not so cool. Uh, the setting is not going to take effect until we bounce the cluster. And that is going to cause a brief disruption when we do it. Um, SQL Server will unfortunately take all the availability databases down for a little bit. Um, so what I do, we can we can do this from inside PowerShell, uh, but I personally like to bring down the listener first. And then at this point, I will usually reach out to whoever is helping with networking stuff. Have the network admin go into the whatever DNS we're using and check to be sure everything looks good here. In this case, we're fine. Usually we're fine, but every once in a while, you'll see a bunch of extra A records for listen up in here that kind of need to be cleaned up before things will work correctly. Once we verified that, uh, then we should be fine to start the cluster back up. And indeed, uh, if we go back into our command window, um, we might have to wait for time to live to expire. If time to live is short enough, we can go back to our command window repeat our command, and we're only getting one IP address back. Uh, so cool, that's what we want. Um, OK, so we fixed it so that the listener only advertises one IP address instead of all of them. What happens if we fail over to a different subnet? Well, that's what I'm doing now. So I go to the other cluster node inside Management Studio. So I'm going to fail over. Get a reasonably fast failover because everything's in synchronous mode now, so the data was caught up. Do our NS lookup again. And success. Um, well, success when it gets there. I. It's, it's easy to miss if you're, because uh, it's like a number suit, but uh, if you look at the first one, the IP address is 10. Dot zero dot zero dot forty two. For the second call to NS lookup, we're getting back ten dot zero dot one dot forty two. So the subnet did indeed get updated at failover time. Okay, so takeaways from this demo: by default, when you add a second subnet to an AG, uh, all the listener IP addresses are going to be registered with the DNS. Uh, that behavior is controlled. You can turn it off. So the advantage of this default behavior is there is less downtime. So after I turned register all pro provider IPs off and did the failover, uh, two things had happened. The failover had to complete. The second thing that had to happen is all of the cache DNS, DNS entries had to expire before the new IP address will be propagated through our system. So depending on what your time to live is set to, there can be some extra downtime that happens if you do a cross subnet failover. How big of a problem is that? It depends on your situation. If you're uh, mostly on-prem and you have a DR site and you're uh, only doing failovers between subnets, if you have a, a disaster recovery situation, um, you could make the case that like oh, a, no, no, no. you could make a case that like a, a 20 minute um, downtime might be kind of okay because you're going to be busy doing stuff at the DR site anyway. But if you're in a situation like Amazon EC2, where if you're um, doing clusters on there, everything kind of ends up being a subnet cluster just because of the way the networking works. Um, the extra downtime can be a problem because you hit it every single time you do a failover. Um, but what's the disadvantage? The disadvantage is it breaks, uh, it breaks frankly, a lot of things uh, with the default behavior. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, this next slide basically just walks through what I did in the demo. Uh, it's simply to, to turn off the setting if you do want to turn it off. And full disclosure, me personally, I almost always end up turning the setting off. Um, don't take that, uh, if you're listening to this and aren't familiar with these issues, don't take that as a recommendation that you should automatically go through and always turn this off. Um, there are cases where it makes sense to have the setting off and cases where it makes sense to go ahead and leave it turned on. Um, and, and different people have different situations. Um, but yeah, as we saw in the demo, you can turn it off, shut down the cluster, make sure the DNS is okay, bring the cluster back up, and you should be ready to rock and roll. <clears throat> um, duplicate slides. Okay, but uh, what if we don't want to turn it off? I mean, so Microsoft made this the default behavior. Uh, we may think they had a pretty good reason for it. And, and actually, it, it is kind of a cool feature. Uh, 
So what if we want, what if we want to leave the register all providers IP set to the default of one? Um, so there's a lot of questions I think you should ask yourself. If you have any third-party applications, are your third-party vendors okay with the idea of even messing with our connection string? If they're not, then usually they're not, then see the previous slide. You probably need to turn the setting off. If you have any first-party applications, um, do you have the ability to specify arbitrary connection strings for them? Uh, or is it a situation where you can only specify host name and username and the application generates the connection string? Um, if you do have the ability to specify arbitrary connection strings, do you know where all the connection strings are set or are you going to have to look some of them up? Or if any of the connection strings are set in code, do you have time for the developers to update those connection strings and, you know, arguably while they're doing it, more importantly, make the connection strings configurable for the future before you have to do the, your DR site setup um, or, um, yeah, do you have time for all that to happen? If the answer to any of those questions is no, then see the previous slide. So here's the one that really kills people, though. The, the other ones weren't too bad. In your organization, do you have any users that like to go on the internet and download code samples that show them how to pull data from SQL Server and present it inside an Excel spreadsheet with, instead of talking to you about the best way to do that? If they do, you probably want the setting uh, off uh, at least initially, because the odds are the code samples that they're downloading are using a version of the driver that is not compatible with multi-subnet failover. And Excel is, is so common in, uh, in corporate life, uh, there's, there's a decent chance you might have users doing that. Oh, and, and of course, uh, the first thing I should have asked is, um, have you already adjusted the setting and is stuff already broken? If that's the case, you probably at least temporarily want to see the previous slide and just turn off the setting because it's going to be the fastest way to get people up and running. So if you're still with me, um, the good news is it's actually really easy to live with the setting. Uh, you basically just have to go into your connection strings and add the clause multi subnet failover equal true uh, and things should start working. And I shouldn't say just, you know, you don't want to do this in production without testing. Uh, turning on multi-subnet failover, it's not supported by all drivers. You need to be sure it's supported. Even if you're positive it's supported, you do want to test it first, of course, because it does change the connection behavior a little bit. Um, but if you have first, if you have control over connection strings, this actually isn't a bad setting. I just personally end up in lots of situations where I, I just can't set this option in the connection string for various reasons. Um, yeah, so really interesting problem. And I, so the, the reason I like talking about this particular demo is um, when this happens, and I've seen a rash of these lately, I, I think a lot of people are just starting to migrate from using log shipping to using availability groups for their DR purposes. I've been seeing a lot of these lately, and every time I go through one of these, it, it feels like um, when somebody has this problem, you're, you're saying something equivalent to, so yeah, you know how I told you you should spend all this money for duplicate hardware to set up a DR site so that you have more better high availability through a disaster? Um, well, actually, that DR site is why your production databases are, are down. Uh, you're, you're welcome. It's it's a hard conversation to have. So even if this is kind of an unusual problem and it's a one-time fix, uh, it's I think it's important for us to uh, work through what's happening here. But um, moving along, um, it's actually a much, much more interesting problem they want to talk through. So, um, so for this next setup, full disclosure, uh, I just love talking about this particular problem at the moment because I've seen uh, this happen a ton of times in the past year or so. Um, it's not an especially subnet problem. Uh, this actually happens frequently, even if there's only one subnet involved in the AG. And it's uh, kind of a difficult problem to reproduce. But here's the situation. We have a two node availability group again. We have a file share witness again. Um, and we have the, uh, oh, incidentally, I should also uh, quickly give a quick thank you to, to David Klee. He let me borrow a couple of machines to reproduce this demo. Um, 
So I have to keep using my same uh, tired old cloud images. Uh, yeah, so we have node A, which is currently hosting the availability group. There's also a node B in the cluster, and node B is currently hosting the core cluster services for us. Um, as it seems to always be the case when we have problems with an availability group, we're, we're doing some weekend patching. And this, uh, so this particular problem only really happens if we're doing a specific kind of patch uh, that interferes with the network availability. So examples of when this can happen, antivirus updates uh, or security endpoint updates are kind of notorious for um, interrupting the network connection briefly. Um, things like uh, VMware, VMware uh, client tools updates can also cause networking issues. Um, and there's also a lot of things that kind of have to happen in a very, very short span of time um, for this particular issue to happen. So there are going to be some parts of the demo that seem a little bit forced, um, but I'll, I'll walk through a more realistic uh, timeline of how this stuff can actually happen afterwards. OK, so first off, we're on our primary node for the availability group. I'm going to turn on this firewall rule to block access to the fascia witness. I am not implying here that the primary node of the AG has lost communication with fascia witness. This is actually, there's like a six second timeout in effect that a bunch of stuff has to break during. I can't have that six second timeout in the middle of a demo. So I'm using the firewall rule to simulate the fascia witness being locked uh, by the other node. Uh, when our availability group node is trying to get to it. OK, so that's done. I'm going to hop over. Oh, I'm also going to start at my workload. Uh, it's sometimes kind of hard to tell when things go down if you're just using Management Studio. So I just start up a quick PowerShell window, and I have this code here. If you're not a shit PowerShell person, all this is doing is an infinite loop. It's running a really simple select statement against one of our availability group databases and then sleeps for five seconds and queries it again. The idea is when we see the AG go down, we should see this query start failing. And with that, we're gonna hop over to our other cluster node. So this is node B. Uh, we can hop into the uh, failover cluster manager and see that yes, indeed, our availability group is up and running over on node A. And the cluster uh, stuff is running here locally on node B, uh, just to verify where we are. And so now we're going to simulate that our you know, VMware uh, client tools update has started messing with our network and they've lost communication with the other node. Uh, to give me time to demo it, I'm simulating that with firewall rules instead of actually trying to do an update live in the middle of this demo. OK, so this is while the update is running, we're having network problems. Um, now let's go ahead and get to the part where we, uh, where the network, where the update has completed, um, because we've been messing with uh, the system software. It's time to reboot Windows. Um, we can't actually really reboot Windows because it would come up before I could get back to the other window. Uh, instead, what I'm going to do is find the cluster service, and I'm just going to kind of uh, stop it. which will have the effect of making it look like this node B has, uh, has gone down for an extended reboot. And I will point out, it seems like it takes an awfully long time for the service to go down. Um, I, I think that's significant. I think this is actually a critical part of the problem. I, I believe at this point, what's happening is during a graceful shutdown of the, uh, of the service, it's communicating with the Fauscher witness and updating the uh, geometry of the availability or the geometry of the cluster before it goes down. Okay. Oh no, we rebooted our secondary node and our primary is down. Well, no, these error messages are actually an artifact of how I'm testing this. Um, here it's complaining because um, they can't talk to the Fauscher witness. I should just go in, turn off that firewall rule I had that was blocking my access to the Fauscher witness. Um, disable firewall rule. Now we're back in touch with it. 
So if I would not have already implied uh, that the availability group is going to go down as part of this demo, this is probably where we would expect the query to start succeeding again. Because what we might expect is that Node A can reach out to the file share witness, say, you know, hey, I am a member of the cluster. I promise I'm healthy. I don't know what happened to Node B, but please let me take over the cluster so I can bring SQL Server online. We don't get that. Instead, we start seeing a different error message. Uh, so instead of just simply saying we don't have quorum, we now see an error message that just says our AG is neither in primary or secondary mode. Um, OK, gosh, that's that's kind of odd. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hop over to the, uh, the Windows event log, because there is um, there is an event in there that I think is really just kind of a uh, like a screaming red flag that this kind of race condition is happening. So to do a quick refresh. And here, th this is kind of the event that tells me that, that this problem has come up. The error is cluster service failed to start because the node detected that it does not have the latest copy of the cluster configuration data. Changes occurred, blah, blah, blah. So in other words, what is happening is node A has gotten in touch with the file share witness. It was able to learn from the file share witness that something changed while it's out of touch with both the witness and also with node B but it does not actually know what changed. Because it doesn't know what changed, it can't be certain that SQL Server wasn't running or, or any other cluster service wasn't running on the other node after it went down. So because it doesn't know, it's just gonna stay down. Um, okay, so in this particular situation, it's not so bad um, because remember, we were just rebooting the other server. It's eventually going to come back up. So here I restart the cluster service to simulate, you know, hey, Node B has finished this reboot process. It's back up and back to life. Uh, we don't need these firewall rules anymore because, you know, after the server reboots, its network is going to be fine. And if we go to the failover cluster manager, we can actually kind of already see stuff is coming back up. Um, so the cluster is, is back online. Uh, node B, the local node is the host server, which we expected. And if we look over at nodes, we can actually even see that we've already decided that node A is healthy and has been brought back in the fold of uh, you know, legitimate cluster nodes. Okay, and hey, huzzah. So we go back to cluster to node A and we can see that the availability group has already come online. Cool. So uh, how would this present in real life? Um, how would this present in real life? Um, in real life, what this might sound like is someone comes up to us and says, you know, hey, I was doing patching last weekend. Uh, it included a antivirus update, for example. Uh, and it's weird, I rebooted the secondary and our entire availability group went offline for, you know, like five or 10 seconds, but it came back up as soon as the secondary node came back up. Have you ever heard, ever heard of that? Um, so what actually happened? Because I, I know watching me work through that demo, seeing all the firewall rules in place, uh, it seems like it was very, very forced. Um, and indeed, this is a kind of an unlikely case to happen. Um, I, th I think I've seen like three or four of them this year personally. So that's not, I mean, it's not as unlikely as you might expect, but it's not something everybody is going to see every month. Um, so there's actually a family of these failures, I believe. Here's an example uh, of how one of them can happen. So you have two swim lanes, and time is receding from the left to the right side of the screen. At the top, we have what was cluster node B in our demo. It's where the uh, Windows failover cluster is hosted. At the bottom is our availability group uh, node that says node A in the demo. So first, our uh, cluster node loses communication uh, across with the other, uh, with node A. Then right after that, it locks the file share witness. 
Now I'd be willing to bet half to three quarters of you probably just grimaced or made some kind of face because it sounds like I'm saying something really odd. That's, you know, Rick, surely you didn't just say that this node has lost all network connectivity, but it's still reaching out to the uh, file share witness across the network. Um, yeah, it does sound weird. I, it actually took me a uh, really, really long time to believe that's what's happening when he's looking at the cluster logs, but you can actually verify in the aftermath of this failure, you can actually verify from the cluster logs that that kind of is what happened. You, you can see the node, nodes losing communication with each other. However, the online cluster node is still able to access the file share witness. Um, it's not quite as crazy as it sounds, but I believe is happening. So inside a Windows failover cluster, um, there are actually some virtual cluster adapters uh, built in that are sort of optimized to try to keep communication between failover cluster nodes um, as, uh, as resilient as possible. It's a little bit ironic for me to say, keep it as resilient as possible, followed by what I'm about to say. But what I think happens in this failure case is that um, when the antivirus or the VMware tools client patch is messing with the network, I think it throws off those internal network adapters inside the cluster sufficiently that the cluster nodes have trouble communicating with each other, but the networking is still working well enough that it can reach the file share witness. Um, there are other mechanisms that could explain that, however. So regardless, regardless of how the failure happens, we lose communication, we lock the file share witness. Now, um, in a two node failover cluster, when the nodes lose communication with each other, what they will do, since they can't communicate directly, what they will do is they'll start trying to use the file share witness to communicate with each other, what their status is and who's online. When this happens, um, the node that was hosting the Windows cluster gets first dibs. Uh, it's allowed to lock the file share witness first. There's something called an arbitration delay, which I showed here with the red arrow. During the arbitration delay period, it defaults to six seconds, but I think it's actually adjustable. During that period, um, and this is our window for a race condition to happen, none of the other nodes are allowed to lock the file share witness until this expires, uh, unless, uh, unless the, uh, the uh, node that's hosting the cluster gives up its lock voluntarily. So, okay, so we've locked the file share witness. The uh, node, node A, where our availability group is living, detects it can't lock the file share witness, so it doesn't know what's happening with the rest of the cluster. Over back here on the top slope swim lane, whatever patch we're doing that was messing with the network has completed, and we're starting to reboot. As part of the reboot process, when the cluster service is shut down, um, an update is made to the data in the file share witness, and then Windows starts to go down hard. So at the point where the reboot has started and the uh, node B has gone cold. Node A is finally able to lock the, the file share witness. And this is where it says, you know, oh gosh, I, I can tell from the file share witness something has changed. I, I know, don't know what changed. Um, so I better just shut down until I can figure out what's happening, until I get a chance to talk to the other nodes and see what happened. So this is where we have our short production outage as a result of rebooting the secondary node. Finally, back in our top swim lane, the node comes back up reestablishes communication with, uh, reconnects to the file share witness to bring the cluster online, reestablishes communication with our node A, and finally at the end, everything is back up and happy. Uh, okay, so if you're still with me here, um, well, so uh, I should say before that, gosh, why are you still talking about this, Rick? Um, you know, if it's that, that rare for the problem to happen, um, this is an unusual failure case, but uh, again, it, it, it does occur a little bit more frequently than I would have expected. Uh, at certain sites, it seems to happen repeatedly, um, so it's not completely random. There, there is a component that if they build the hardware a certain way, it seems to be more common. Uh, but more importantly, this is just one of those really awkward conversations uh, that we could have if, you know, whether it's a consultant talking to your client or a DBA talking to your boss. This is one of those times where, you know, much like the last demo, it's going to sound like we're saying, um, yeah, so yeah, you know how we spent all this money building availability group, uh, got the redundant servers, redundant storage, and did all this uh, to 
keep our databases highly available. So actually that outage that we had a couple of days ago was a result of the database being highly available. You know, had we had we not added to the availability group, it would have stayed up. Uh, you're you're welcome. It's um it, it's a really awkward situation. So it's it's great to head off this problem uh, if we can, or at least once we see it stop it from happening again. So how do we mitigate this? Um, for the specific configuration laid out in the demo, um, I'm actually actively researching this myself because I, I haven't given up hope on the idea that there's a settings fix for this, but at this time, I'm not aware of a foolproof 100% fix for the problem, unfortunately. Uh, what things, in the absence of doing something weird. Okay, so weird things we, we could do that would help. If we add more nodes to the availability group, that helps because there's more votes that we can form a quorum from. Am I really saying that you should add a third node to your cluster for the sole purpose of not having to stand up a file share witness? Um, no, no ish. You know, it's it's actually not the craziest thing I've heard. Mostly because you know, if I look back, you know, gosh, I know five, ten years, maybe a little bit farther. We used to spin up entire SQL Server instances to be witnesses for automated automated failover with database mirroring. And this doesn't even have to be a Windows Server. It could just be, sorry, this doesn't even have to be a database server. It could just be a Windows Server that's part of the cluster. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not totally nuts, but no, I'm not seriously advocating that. That'd be a waste of money. Um, but if, if you end up in the situation where it makes sense to add more nodes, maybe as readable secondaries, the problem might go away on its own. Um, shared disk witness uh, can fix this. So one weakness of a file share witness is it basically, it, it doesn't have a complete dump of the uh, database of, well, I should say database. It doesn't have a complete dump of all the information that, clus that cluster nodes pass back and forth between each other. It really basically just has whether or not a change has happened recently, or it basically has a version ID stored on it. In other words, if a cluster node can see the file share witness, but not the other nodes, it can know whether or not something has changed. They cannot know what changed. A shared disk witness is different. A shared disk witness has a lot more information on it, um, and you can use that information to cover more gracefully. However, a shared disk witnesses uh, just are not an option, frankly, uh, almost anywhere nowadays. I mean, in a strictly on-prem situation, maybe, but you can't have these spanning multiple sites. So you can't have them for the most part in the cloud, certainly not in a hybrid cloud. So yeah, that, that doesn't help us much either. Uh, really the best fix I've found for this is to uh, just simply make sure that the cluster is hosted on the same node that is hosting your availability group when you're doing patching. Um, that eliminates the problem where you know the availability group is able to see the or the cluster is able to see the file share witness, uh, but can't communicate with the AG if they're on the same node. That breakdown in communication does not happen. Um, unfortunately, that's not really a engineering fix. That's almost more of a process fix because, in effect, I'm saying that you know when when the DBA staff or when the operations staff in general is doing patches, they should check for where the cluster is running and fail it over if they need to. Um, it's not that that's a bad thing. I think it's good to know um, which node your cluster your which node is hosting your cluster. It's probably good to pick which node should be hosting your cluster, especially if you're about to do patching. It's just if, if a person is responsible for doing that, it's easy for them to forget. Now, um, if you're thinking right now that we should just have like an agent job that checks periodically and makes sure that the, um, you know, it could be like a PowerShell job step that checks periodically and, you know, just make sure that the uh, cluster host is the same as the uh, availability group primary. That's actually a great idea. I I'm saying that in part because, you know, that, that was actually my first thought. And uh, I, I think it goes a long way that that might be a good like 90% fix. I just don't advocate it as a full mitigation because it's not a 100% fix. If you're doing this like once a day to be sure things are on the same node, that's not gonna cover you on the day that you're doing patches and you're doing multiple reboots and multiple failovers. You would actually have to be checking this like once a minute. And that's like a lot of time spent checking something that only matters um, when you're doing patching. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, that, that's a that's mitigation and that combined with, uh, you know, being careful about what updates affect the network. Um, some of you might be wondering if turning off uh, dynamic quorum helps with this. Uh, my, so actually my experience has been that turning off dynamic quorum does, does seem to help, but it doesn't eliminate the problem. So I, I personally have some hesitations about dynamic quorum as it relates to SQL Server anyway. But e even then, I, I'm not going to say that we should be turning off dynamic quorum when it doesn't actually really fix this, this problem. Um, uh, the other thing that could help would be to shorten the length of this arbitration delay. That said, I think shortening the arbitration delay makes this problem less likely to occur. I, I don't think it completely fixes it. Um, great, and uh, with that, I'm not as over time as I was afraid I would be, but I think I have been blathering on for at least an hour. Uh, so with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening, and um, I think we could go ahead and open it up for, uh, for questions, answers, and discussion. That was outstanding. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> These are truly real-world challenges that you're gonna see and you're you're, you're gonna look at the stuff and go what the heck is going on until you actually hear that these scenarios exist or run into them in the wild if anybody has any questions i would love for you to enter them in the chat window or come off a of mute and ask away uh, we've got plenty of time left so let's open the floor And we'll give everybody a moment if there's any additional questions. Um, in the meantime, there we go. <clears throat> um, okay, so Edwin made a comment about dynamic quorum and dynamic mm -hmm. witness only works when there are three or more voting members. Can we, Rick, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's actually uh, a great point with, with dynamic quorum, because um, yeah, that, that kind of explains why it, you know, doesn't, help that much with the two node situation because yeah, it's not functioning when there's only two nodes. So if you haven't heard the phrase before, dynamic quorum, um, let me turn it around. If, if we're talking about not dynamic quorum, what that would look like is, um, let's not talk about a two node AG. Let's say we have five nodes. Uh, if, we have, if we had five nodes in our cluster and three of them blew up, uh, we would expect the cluster to go offline because if we only have two votes, we cannot get a majority of the votes we expect. Uh, with dynamic quorum on, if those th same three nodes blow up at the same time, we still have the same problem. We lost three votes simultaneously. We lost more than half our voting share. We're gone. But with dynamic quorum turned on, um, if you lose those nodes one after the other, so one, one node dies, half an hour later, node two dies, half an hour later, node three dies. Dynamic quorum is a feature that will actually um, temporarily take away the votes of those nodes as they go down. So that in effect, the size of your cluster is shrinking as you go. Um, what you get from that is it lets you, no matter how no many nodes you started with, uh, it lets you run until you're actually all the way down to one node before you finally go off. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really, really cool feature. Um, I, one of the reasons I at one point had some hope that turning it off could be helpful for this problem was um, I, was, I was hopeful that dynamic quorum might be the reason that the, um, the update is going out from the cluster to the file share witness as the cluster service is going down. Um, it turns out that's not it, that there's other information that's getting written out, uh, even if it's just a suspicion that the other node is offline. Um, Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I may have lost track of the question in talking. <laughs> good. You're good. Uh, we do have a couple other questions here. Um, will pausing a node before patching help prevent the outed situations that you described? Yeah, I, I believe it would. So there's all kinds of things that could help. The, the one my go-to is to fail over uh, the cluster to be not on the node that you're patching. Um, I think pausing would also do it. Um, Removing the node's vote might do it. Stopping the cluster service would do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's actually not a hard problem to avoid if you have the presence of mind to check for it before you do patching. Okay. Um, 
from VJ, would there be any benefits of using site awareness features in a multi subnet AG? Uh, by site awareness, are you thinking site preference? Um, That's where I think he is referring to, yes. Yeah. Um, so if we're talking SQL Server, in my opinion, yes. Um, if for no other reason than in SQL Server world, well, okay. I mean, of course, if we're talking SQL Server, the answer is it depends. But if we get past that, and we're talking about the majority of cases, usually we have one kind of primary data center that has the crown jewels in it. And we might have a DR site, and we might have a handful of satellite offices that we're pushing data to, but kind of all the action is happening at one place. So yeah, I, I actually do like the idea that we should have a preference for keeping stuff in the right place uh, in, in that one geographic location. Cool. Uh, got another question here. Do the nodes go down always incrementally in 30 minute slots? Uh, yeah, no, uh, no I, I don't think there's any. Oh, yeah, for the dynamic form discussion. Um, now, 3D minutes is just an example. Um, it, it can be random. So, uh, you know, you can lose one node a day later, lose another one. Uh, 30 seconds, maybe. I don't know if that might be too fast, but 30 seconds later, lose another one. And dynamic form will still keep working. There, there's nothing magic about the 30 minute increments. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Are there any other questions or thoughts or really anything else about availability groups that you, anybody wants to ask? And I, I'm going to guess we're in a really good spot here to go ahead and wrap up. I don't have anything new in the chat window. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Rick, for presenting an amazing session. Um, the string of presenters we've had lately have just been phenomenal, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. That's uh... It's good to speak again. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. The last couple of years have been really interesting for all of us with this stuff. So trying to bring back a little bit of a sense of normalcy with this stuff. Uh, so thank you very much. And for everybody out there, if you're watching this live or recorded, if you have any questions that you think might actually make a really good presentation that we can create for you, we would love to do that. We're always interested in different twists on the theme or something new that comes out of the woodwork that tripped you up. Or if you just have a topic, like back to basics, you know, the last couple of sessions we've had have been very, you know, they're, they're foundational level sessions that really go a long way to helping people understand not just the technology and the technical aspects of business continuity, but more of the organizational side. So if these are the kind of sessions you want to see, let us know. We want to make content here that you are, that, that you want. So keep us in the loop. If there's any presenters out there that have a session you'd love to present, let us know. Uh, you know, we'd love to get some new speakers on here and line stuff up through the middle of next year even. Uh, so let us know. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. We'll get this out on YouTube, hopefully by end of day today, and uh, we'll go from there.